Good morning, and welcome to worship with St. John. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace and peace, as you might have seen in the email that went out on Wednesday, St. John's will begin holding in-person outdoor worship services next Sunday, September 27th at 11 a.m. We will still be doing these videos each week for those who wish to continue worshiping virtually. This will simply be an in-person version of this service with two exceptions. We will not be singing hymns in person and we will not be sharing communion. Those are just two things that we can't do in person right now. Uh, there are a couple of things that we want to share with you about these outdoor services. First is that masks are required for everyone over two years old. Now, these need to be masks that strap over the ears and tightly seal around the face. Uh, not bandanas, not the neck gaiters that you pull up over, not scarves. Uh, if you do not have a mask like that, we will have some available at the check-in table, but the masks must cover your nose and your mouth the entire time that we are together. Also, we must maintain a physical distance of at least six feet. There are going to be ushers on hand to help space out the chairs. Uh, and while we're not having a fellowship time after worship, if you are talking to someone, we ask that you please observe the appropriate distance between you. We realize that a lot of you want to be together with your church family to worship, and this is just what we have to do in order to be able to do that right now. Uh, so you will need to sign up by Thursday to let us know that you are coming. You can do that through our website. There'll be a link in the quick links section on our main page that you can click on to enter your name, the names of anyone who might be coming with you, uh, and an email address and phone number. This will give us a general idea of how many people are going to be coming, uh, and it will also help with contact tracing if that becomes necessary. So the link will be up on the website tomorrow morning, Monday morning. You can start signing up then. Sign up by Thursday. You can also sign up by calling or emailing Laura in the church office. Just be sure to give her names, email address, and phone number. If you call after hours and she is not able to answer, you can leave a message saying you want to come to worship on Sunday, but leave names, email address, and phone number. Uh, you can bring your own chair with you. If you have an outdoor chair that you like, bring that with you. If you can't bring a chair with you, we will have some folding chairs available. The ushers will help with that. The entrance driveway that we usually use will be closed, so you will enter through the exit driveway, park in that back lower lot, and walk up to the check-in table where you will check in with an usher. There will also be a, a basket or some kind of drop box on the check-in table where you can give your offering since we won't be passing plates during worship, and of course, you can still mail in your offering uh, if you prefer to do that. No handshakes or hugs. As much as I know that I am going to want to do that when I finally get to see so many of you uh, for worship again, I think we all just know that's something that we can't do right now. Uh, no one should feel pressured to come. If you aren't sure, if you aren't comfortable, if you are in a more vulnerable population, if you are immunocompromised, we encourage you to continue worshiping virtually. If you aren't feeling well, if you have a fever of 100.4 or higher or are otherwise showing any symptoms, we expect that you will stay home in order to keep your church family safe. We will do this, weather permitting, for as many weeks as we can, as long as it continues to be safe to do so. If there is inclement weather one week, we won't try to reschedule for later in the day. We will just cancel for that week, and an announcement will go out by 9 a.m. by email and on the church website. Now, we want to stress that this does not automatically mean that we will be coming back into the sanctuary when the weather gets too cold to be outside. At this point, based on the data, it is just not safe enough to do that right now. The task force continues to monitor the data for Chester County, and they will make a recommendation to the session when the time comes. 
But what we do know about this virus is that being outdoors with masks and distancing minimizes the risk of exposure to the virus so it is safe enough to do this right now. We have a good plan in place, and if we all follow that plan, we can be together to worship for a little while. So that is next Sunday. You can start signing up tomorrow. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or to a member of the task force. Our names and email addresses are on the email that went out on Wednesday. If you did not receive that email, just contact me or Lara and we can get that to you right away. But for now, I want to invite you, let us rise as we are able in body or in spirit as we join together in singing our opening hymn, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Let us worship God. Please join me in this morning's prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Good and great God, we pray that we might have our hearts be attuned to your presence, that your spirit would come into this place and that we may glorify you, that we may see you in a new light, that we may learn something new from your word, God, all glory and honor are to you, our creator. We give you thanks for all the ways that you work in and among us each and every day. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is written by the Apostle Paul from prison. He's writing to the people of Philippi. The reading is found in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 30. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. 
My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come closer to the screen for the children's sermon. And if you have your cross ready that came to you in the back to school blessing uh, package, bring it with you and you can hold it when we say our final prayer. Have you ever written a letter? Maybe in school you were taught how to address a letter, what to say in a letter, what to say at the end, how to greet someone. I remember learning that in school. Maybe you've made a postcard or even just a get well soon card and maybe you handmade it. I love still getting mail. Although when you become an adult, you get the mail you don't wanna get and they're called bills. But early in the church, people used to write letters to each other and pastors, especially one named Paul, would write a letter to churches, to his friends at different churches. And these letters became something that became a part of our Bible. So we read letters in the Bible. We read letters that Paul wrote to churches. And today in church, we're going to read a letter that Paul wrote to a church in a place called Philippi. And in the place of Philippi, Christians were trying to figure out what it meant to live their lives like Jesus and to love God. And this is what Paul encouraged them to do. Paul encouraged them to do something, this is kind of a fancy phrase that's hard to understand for us sometimes, to live beyond yourself. Now you can think at home about what you think that means. Maybe ask an adult in the room to live beyond yourself. I think living beyond yourself means that sometimes you have to think about how you want to take care of someone. So some of you often probably remember when you were at a playground or at school or maybe even at church and someone is really upset and they need you to just put your arm around them and say, you know what, I know you're having a bad day and I'm really sorry, but I'm here for you. Or maybe living beyond yourself means that you help do an extra chore around the house for mom and dad. Maybe living beyond yourself would look like you playing with your sister or brother when you don't usually want to, but you know that it would mean a lot to them. These are some ways that you can live beyond yourself. These are some ways that we can be like Christ because Christ spent a lot of time caring for other people. And so boys and girls, as you grab your cross, I want you to think about a way this week that you can live beyond yourself, that you can be like Jesus, and that you can think about Paul's letter in this way. Let's pray. Dear God, 
Help us this week to live beyond ourselves. Help us to remember the people we love and all those who need our help around us. Especially, God, we pray that you would help us remember to love other people like Jesus loves us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next week, boys and girls. The movie A Hidden Life tells the true story of a man named Franz Jagerstadter, a farmer and devout Christian who lived in Austria in the 1930s. He lived uh, with his wife and three daughters outside a, a rural village where they spent their days working, playing in the fields, dancing, laughing, caring for their local church, and sharing a quiet happy life together with others in their village. But in 1940, after German troops invaded Austria, Franz was conscripted into the German army to fight for the Nazis. While a lot of the men around him were kind of quietly resigned to having to do this, Franz really struggled with it. He knew that Hitler was an evil man, and as a Christian, he wrestled with the morality of war, so he got several deferments as a farmer, but in 1943, he was called to active duty. And there's a series of scenes in the movie where he is just struggling with what to do. He knows that if he goes and fights, there's a chance that he could get to come back and be with his family again. If he survives, there's a chance that he could be with them. But he also knows that if he does that, he'll be supporting a cause that he feels is unjust and evil. If he resists and refuses to fight, he'll be thrown in prison and likely killed, leaving his wife and daughters alone. He wants to be with his family and continue living life together. But ultimately, he doesn't do what he wants. He does what he thinks is necessary. I was thinking about that this past week as I read Paul's letter to the Philippians. Because Paul faced a similar situation. A little background on this letter. Uh, Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in the Greek city of Philippi somewhere around the year 60 AD. We don't know exactly, but somewhere around there, while he was imprisoned by the Roman Empire awaiting trial and eventually execution. Philippi was a very important city in the Roman Empire, and it was referred to as a little Rome. The people who lived there, even though they were Greek, had been declared official Roman citizens, which carried with it a lot of privileges. And the Philippians took a lot of pride in their Roman status. To put it in our terms, this was a very patriotic city. And because of that, the Christians in Philippi had a very difficult time. As Paul stresses throughout his other letters, they are citizens not of the Roman Empire, the kingdom of man. They are citizens of the kingdom of God. They did not pledge allegiance to Caesar, but to Christ. The Romans professed that Caesar is Lord, while Christians professed that Jesus is Lord. They would have met with a lot of resistance from the citizens of Philippi. They would have said, Hey, we're proud to be a part of the Roman Empire. You should be proud to be a part of the Roman Empire. We've got a great thing going here, and if you keep talking like that, you're going to mess it up for all of us. You're not doing your duty as a citizen. 
That's important, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later. But that's essentially why Paul was in prison in the first place. He's been going around proclaiming the kingdom of God and saying that Jesus is Lord. So he has met with resistance from the Roman Empire, and he has been arrested and imprisoned. He's writing this letter to the church in Philippi while under house arrest. So he has a little bit more freedom than someone who's chained up in prison somewhere. Uh, but Paul shares with the Philippians the struggle that he is facing. He knows that this is all probably going to end up with him being executed. And he's okay with that because it means that he'll get to go and be with Jesus. At the same time, though, he founded the church in Philippi. These people are Christians in large part because of him. He feels a tremendous responsibility for them, and they have been taking care of him while he's in prison. Paul knows them, and he loves them, and he doesn't want to leave them. He wants to go back to Philippi and see them again. So he says to them, I don't know which one I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. I mean, to, to live in eternal glory with Christ, that's what he knows he could have. But he says to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Because if he lives, he can keep working with them and nurturing their faith. I remember years ago, I knew this man whose wife had been dead for about a decade. And he missed her so much. Every time he talked about her, he'd get teary-eyed. And this was not someone who got teary-eyed, but every time he talked about her, he did. And he would say, I just want to see her again. I can't wait to see my wife again. He was ready to go so that he could be together with his wife in heaven. But at the same time, he would talk about his grandkids. And he would say, I really want to watch them grow up. I love them so much, and I don't want to leave them. He was torn between the two. It's the same kind of situation that Paul faced. And what my friend said was, I'm going to live as long as I can for them. And when my time comes, I'm ready. Paul ends up saying, I really want to go be with Christ, but I know that you need me. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith. He doesn't choose what he wants. He chooses what they need. And you know, to a certain degree, he doesn't have any control over that. I mean, he's a prisoner awaiting trial and execution. He could choose to remain in the flesh all he wants, but when the Romans choose for him not to, that's it. But what he's saying here is, I am going to keep fighting and keep trying. I'm not just going to give up and let them kill me. I am going to fight for you. I'm going to live as long as I can for you. And when my time comes, I'm ready. What he wanted and what was necessary were two different things. And he chose what was necessary. Remember the quote that I've shared with you the past few weeks that's guiding our look at Paul's letters to the Romans and the Philippians. It's by a theologian named Israel Kamadzandu who says, the main challenge of our time is to live with a transformed mind, a mind that is open to the other and leads to inner transformation. 
It is crucial, he says, for Christians to consider each human being as a loving partner on the journey of life and to live each day beyond the self. The Philippians were Paul's loving partners on the journey of life. And by choosing what they needed rather than what he wanted, he was living each day beyond the self. We're all faced with difficult choices like this between what we want and what others need. I mean, we're all living through one right now. Not a single one of us wants to quarantine and wear masks all the time and practice physical distancing. That's not how any of us envisioned this year unfolding. But it's what is necessary right now. It's what we need of each other in order to keep one another healthy and safe. And so we have to choose each day to live beyond the self, to live beyond simply what I want, taking your life and your needs into consideration. I came home from work the other day, and uh, I was exhausted. I had a headache. All I wanted to do was just sit down and relax for a moment. But as soon as I opened the door, one of our kids came into the room just like bouncing off the walls like a pinball saying, Dad, Dad, will you go outside and play football with me? And I'll be honest with you, I really didn't want to do that at that moment. But I knew that if I didn't, he would be really disappointed. He'd been looking forward to it all afternoon. And second, he'd just go sit in front of a screen until dinner. I knew that what was more necessary for him was for me to go outside and play. So I lived beyond the self and went out with him. We had so much fun together. And by the time we came back inside, I felt great. When we love another person, it means living beyond what I want and taking your life and your needs into consideration. And we are called to love everyone to consider each human being as a loving partner on the journey of life, not just the ones who are easy to love, but also the ones who loving them takes a little more effort on our part. We are called to weigh their needs against our desires. Now, the very next thing that Paul says here to the Philippians is live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I am with you or not, I'll know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. And when he says live your lives, Live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. There's something we lose there in the translation from Greek. The word he uses is politueste, and it is a political term. It doesn't just mean live your life. It was a term that was specifically used to refer to civic duty. It means something closer to practice your citizenry, conduct yourselves as a citizen. So he's saying here, practice your citizenry in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And the word for gospel is the Greek word evangelion, uh, which literally means good news and in the Roman Empire was associated with the Roman Emperor Caesar. When Caesar sent out a report 
through the empire of a, of a military or political or social victory, that report was referred to as Evangelion, the good tidings or the good news of Caesar. It was a term that Christians co-opted as a way of saying, Caesar doesn't have good news, Christ has good news. So remember, Paul is saying this to Philippians who were citizens of Rome and proud to be citizens of Rome. He's not saying practice your citizenry in a manner worthy of the good news of Caesar. He's saying practice your citizenry, conduct yourselves in your public life in a manner worthy of the good news of Jesus Christ. He's saying to them, your citizenry is not with Rome, it's with Christ. So in your public life, live in a way that reflects the good news of Christ. This was a politically charged message that could get Paul and the Philippians in a lot of trouble. And Paul knows that. I mean, he's in prison for this very reason. And he says to them, you are going to have to suffer like I am suffering. But Paul embraces his suffering. He doesn't seek it out, but he embraces it when it comes because he says it helps him identify with Christ in his suffering. And Christ, in his life, stood with those who were suffering. Lepers, drunkards, prostitutes, the outcast, outsiders, those whom no one else thought were good enough. Christ suffered with them and for them. What Paul is calling the Philippians to here is to live beyond the self by standing in solidarity with those who suffer so that they might bear witness to the world of the life of Christ. And the calling to us is no different. As individuals and as the church, we are to live as citizens of the kingdom of God in the midst of the kingdom of man, standing in solidarity with those who suffer so that we might bear witness to the world of the good news of Jesus Christ. We don't just live by what we want. We live mindful of what others need. And we give ourselves to that. Even if it means we suffer in the process. That is not the way of the world, which tells us to follow your dreams, look out for yourself, and do what makes you happy. But it is the way of Christ the way that is narrow and hard, but ultimately it will be a sign to the world of our salvation. Who is it that is suffering among us right now? Who is in need? That is who we are called to stand with and give our lives to, as Christ did with us. To live beyond the self by loving them as ourselves. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Lord for the ways that Christ lived beyond the self, giving his own life for our salvation. May we be so gracious and loving with one another, placing their needs above our desires. And may we start here, now, in this simple act of prayer as we lift up to you those who are in need among us. We ask your blessing upon all those in need of healing. 
Kara, Anne and her family, Storm, Sarah, Jenny, Larry, George, Ridgely, and Annie. We ask your blessing on all those who have cancer. Roberta, Hillary, Ida, Laurie, Henrietta, Suzanne, Jude, and Lynn. We pray that your kingdom would fully come among us, bringing healing and peace to the political and racial divisions among us, the anger and fear and violence in our country. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon those who are sick with this virus, that you would bring them the healing that they need. The doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are treating them and working for a cure, that you would keep them safe and healthy and give them the wisdom and energy that they need. We ask your blessing upon those who have lost jobs or are worried about losing them. On all those who are struggling with addiction, depression, and mental illness, especially Stephen and David. And we lift up to you as well the prayers that sit silently in our hearts and minds. Help us, Lord, to live each day beyond the self, standing with those who suffer as Christ stands with us. It is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. As we go into this week, live your public life in a way that reflects the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us, standing with those who suffer, looking to their needs 
above our desires. And as you go, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in grace and peace to serve the Lord.